Hello everybody, good morning and welcome to the United Stand. This is your latest Manchester United transfer news. Is Palinia of Fulham the new number six that Manchester United need? Also, we've got a big update on Victor Oseman because Eric Ten Hag has been talking about the type of striker he wants to bring in. Another update in relation to Rafael Varane. It's a little bit of an improvement. We'll also be talking about the centre-back dilemma. Can people be brought in from the youth? Tom Huddleston's been mentioned. Mengi, we'll get into that as well. Plus a lot more. It's Saturday. Smash a like on the video. It's a weekend of football. It's a big weekend of football. Not just for Manchester United, but we've got to be looking at our rivals in the top four race now. Uh, if we're vulnerable, we need them to start dropping points as well. We'll start off actually with a bit of a positive update before we talk about Palina. This is in relation to Rafael Varane. They're now talking that Rafael Varane will be out for three weeks for Manchester United. So if we whack that into the old um, into the old uh, fixture list for Manchester United, three weeks. Uh, what does that do for Manchester United and Rafael Varane? Um, and hopefully, look, three weeks, hopefully it can be a little bit quicker than that. Three weeks doesn't sound long, but at this time of the season, it is long. Obviously, he's going to miss the Forest game, the Sevilla game, uh, the Brighton game, and that's all in a week. Uh, the next week after that, you've got Spurs away, Villa at home, um, and then Brighton away. And then you're probably looking at West Ham and the first leg of the semi-final as well, if we get through past Sevilla. So he's going to miss massive games, isn't he? You know, the, the Cup semi-final with Brighton, the severe second leg, of course, but also in the Premier League, you're talking about Tottenham away, Brighton away, Villa at home. Um, yeah, we've got to find a way without him. Three weeks is better than all season, I admit, but it's still a huge loss not having uh, Rafael Varane for that long. But it's better than expected, but ultimately... I think any player that's out for two or three weeks at the moment, by the time they come back, the season will be pretty much sorted in relation to cup competitions. Obviously, there'll be a big boost for league competitions. But the hope is we can get to the cup final, we can get to the Europa League semi-final and still be in the race for top four. And then Rafael Varane comes back and instantly makes us better. Obviously, we know Martinez is out for the season. Anyway, let's uh, talk about this uh, transfer story in relation to Paulina of Fulham. Um, it's coming in from, uh, well, £60 million is, is the value. Manchester United very interested. I think it was reported um, in a couple of outlets actually today. I think I read it in the Metro and the Sun and a couple of others as well. Um, keep your eye on Palina because he is a player that was been linked to Manchester United for many years back when he was at Sporting. Obviously, this is his debut season at Fulham. And if you've kept an eye on Fulham this season, everyone will say what a great team Silva's put together there and Mitrovic is absolutely imperative to them. And we've seen since that red card for Mitrovic against Manchester United, their season has started to level off. That happens when you're at Fulham and you are, look, we're moaning about losing our two centre-backs. I mean, it's a big drop-off to Maguire and Lindelof, but it's still achievable if we work hard that we can still hit our goals. When Fulham lose someone like Mitrovic, they don't have anything else there. So I think that to say that Fulham are just a one-man team with Mitrovic is a nonsense. If you've watched them this season, there's been many good performers in that team. Uh, Pereira, a, a, a formerly of Manchester United, had a good season. But Polina, I think, has been really impressive. For a debut season in the Premier League, I think they missed him when they got beat comprehensively by um, Arsenal at Craven Cottage a couple of weeks ago more than they've missed Mitrovic. He is the conductor. He does run that midfield. Um, very, very good at reading the game. Very good at getting on the ball and feeding the forwards. I'd say, in some ways, and I'm not over-egging the pudding here, if I was similar, if I could think of any midfielder that we've had at Man United that he's similar to, um, and I'm not saying they're identical, but if I had to relate him to anybody, it wouldn't be like a Paul Scholes or a Roy Keane. It would be a Michael Carrick. And I think that sort of a midfielder, a Rodri, that sort of a midfielder, is really, really conducive to what Ten Hag wants. And also would be a really decent alternative to Casemiro, who's very unique in the way that he plays uh, as, the, as the holding midfielder. So, look, I'd be really interested in this deal. Um, it would be expensive. He's 27 years of age. He's only had one year in the Premier League. I think they paid around oh, under 20 million for him, around 20 million, let's say. So they're going to want an upgrade on that. They're probably going to want 50, 60 million. Now, he's overpriced at that, but you look at the midfielder market. Casido should be 60. He's probably going for 80. Rice should be 60. Probably going to go for 100. De Jong, we would go for for 70, but might not be available. Bellingham, over 120 million. So 
it's an inflated price market for people like this. But as I just said, when it comes to actual talent and what he brings, I quite like the profile of Polina. Um, especially if you could keep a Sabitzer as well. I think Sabitzer and Polina, instead of a Fred and McTominay, actually improves our midfield if you can retain Ericsson, Casemiro, Bruno. But, I mean, look, that, that might be far-fetched. I think Fred might sign a new contract and there's no indication that McTominay's going to go anywhere. But I certainly think that this is the thing for me. I look at that Man United side and I look at where the progress is and we look at the injuries that we've had to Rashford and to, Mar uh, to Martial and now to Martinez and and um, and and Varan, and we look at the suspensions. I mean, Casemiro has missed seven games, seven Premier League games. So when these players are missing, look at the game against Sevilla. After half an hour, with half an hour to go, he's taken off Bruno, he's taken off Martial. Anthony came off twenty minutes later. You're bringing on Alanga and Veghorst and 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 players that just aren't as good. It's all right having Scott McTominay and Veghorst and Alanga, but that's not what Man City do. That's not what Real Madrid do. They, they bring on Mares. You know, they bring on top quality players. That's the next step for United. So if we can buy a Polinia and stick him on the bench or have him in as an understudy or play him in a lot of games, I think it would be a really good signing. So keep an eye on that one because I'm, I'm not snobby when it comes to who we buy. We don't have to spend £100 million. If the profile of the player fits, I'm not bothered about buying a 27-year-old from Fulham. And I like Polinia. I think he's done a fantastic job. Games are won and lost in the midfield. Fulham are where they are because their midfield's been good and he's been the key pin to that. So keep an eye on that one. Uh, in relation to strikers, very interesting update. Uh, we're going to talk about what Ten Hag said, but uh, more and more, remember I said a few weeks ago, Chelsea and Osman, they are relentless in their approach to get him. This is the player that they want to get. Osman to Chelsea this summer. If you're betting on any deal at the moment for Osman, I would go Chelsea. But not because they haven't got Champions League football. They won't have Champions League football. But next season, they almost want to do what we did with Pogba. It's all about hype, potential, and this is the place to be. And that's why Mourinho, when he came, took Pogba from Juventus when we were in the Europa League. Because it's all about that. Now remember, Chelsea might not even be in the Europa League. In fact, they probably won't be in any European competition next season. So you want a striker that's going to come to your club and buy into the vision that you're selling with a manager, you don't even know what you've got at the moment. So, look, Chelsea shouldn't be able to buy Victor Osman over Manchester United. But there is a balance here. Chelsea have got the money, they've got the front, they've got the aggression, they, they don't care what people think, and they will offer big money and big contracts and say, come to Chelsea, this is the place to be. Man United have got the status, we've got the Champions League, hopefully, we've got you know the stability of Ten Hag, a team that plays a certain way, we're Manchester United. But we don't have the money that, that, that Chelsea have got because we're stuck in this sale process. So it's a very like that if Man United decide to go in. But Chelsea, I would say, are the favourites at the moment, as ridiculous as that sounds, and they're certainly making a lot of noise about that. United need to get into that race. But what I found really interesting was what Eric Ten Hag said in his press conference yesterday when talking about a striker for Manchester United. He basically said this, we need a striker who scores goals because we have the ability in the team to put the balls in the penalty area. So we need a striker who can finish for Manchester United. That was the first thing he said. But then I think there was a really interesting follow-up as, as what he said as well. We have to build a new future. And we need a striker who not only scores goals, but contributes to the balance of the game and the pressure, which is very important. Now, we have to build a new future. And we need a striker who can not only score goals, but contributes to the balance of the game as well. Look, Veghorst cannot stay. There's a short on the channel from Beth, which is basically saying that Veghorst is the worst striker we've ever had. Check it out. I don't know about that. Um, we've had some pretty bad strikers um, who have made way less of a wave than Veghorst. Um, I mean, I did say the other week, you could argue that Agarlo was better than Veghorst. And I said when we bought Veghorst, it feels like an Agarlo signing. It's a low low bar for him to beat it. I don't think Veghorst has beat the Agarlo bar, has he? Um, I don't think he scored a goal in the Premier League. There's been a lot of effort, but Agarlo put a lot of effort in. I just think the hype around Veghorst, the fans took to Veghorst better than they did Agarlo. I don't know why, but actually, I would say Agarlo was better than Veghorst so far. So, you know, he's, he's, he's not the solution. He can't be the solution. He, you know, it, it's like watching your mate run around up front for Man United. You want them to do well and you do like them, but there's a real quality deficiency there. Um, the striker we need is Osman, in my opinion, or a Sesco, or a younger profile of a striker. But 
I think when, when I saw those Ten Hag comments, I was like, well, at the end of the day, he says we've got to build a new future. We need a striker who scores goals, which is also, but he's also a part of the build-up because that's very important. And then you start to think, well, if a new future, you need a, he's talking about a younger striker. But a new future with a striker that can be part of the link-up and score goals can still be Harry Kane. That's still a new future. A new future is defined by how big that future is. Now, if Ten Hag's new future is the next five years, it can't be Harry Kane because Harry Kane's going to be 30 in the summer and there's no guarantee that Harry Kane will be playing at the top level in the Premier League at 35. Just because Lewandowski's done it and Ronaldo doesn't mean Harry Kane will. But if he's talking about a new future next season, of course it can, or the season after that, of course it can be Harry Kane for the next two years. So I still think United are locked in on this Harry Kane deal, but... I still think that Victor Osman's the right deal because I think he can be a striker for the next seven, eight years. And I also think he's going to get better and better. Whereas logically, Harry Kane will level off and get worse over the next couple of years because that's what happens when you hit your early 30s and you're an English striker. He's not Lewandowski. Lewandowski played in the German league for most of his career. The demands on Lewandowski at Bayern Munich physically are not the same as what Harry Kane's been put through for the last 10 years. Um, but look... You can go two ways with that. The fact that Ten Hag mentions new, you think younger striker, but then the fact that he's talking about part of the build-up, scoring goals as well, well, that's Harry Kane in a sentence. So I still think Harry Kane's the one that we're going to go for, and I think it's going to be a very long, frustrating summer trying to get him, and we will overpay. But I think that's where we're going, and I think that's where most people think we're going to go. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. Um, also, just on the centre-back situation, we're seeing a lot of things about that um, and how we're going to do over the next few weeks. There's all sorts of stuff being thrown out there. I think in relation to Phil Jones, he's never had a training session under Eric Ten Hag. So Phil Jones in the equation is irrelevant. Uh, Tom Huddleston, who came in as an under-21 coach and has played some games to the under-21s, my understanding with Phil Jones and Tom Huddleston is they're not registered in the European squad and they're not registered in the Premier League squad. So I don't know how that would even happen. I think that's ridiculously unlikely that either of those two get involved. Um, Mengi apparently is injured until the end of the month, so he can't get involved, which then leads you towards youth players that have never played or even been in the first team squad, let alone bench. So I don't see that um, which then leads you to low knees like Twan Sebi and, um, and Bay, which, again, I don't think we'd do anything with those two. I really think the solution to the centre-back issue is going to be solved by the squad that we've got. Now, ultimately, we've got three centre-backs. We've got Maguire, Lindelof and Luke Shaw. If You can, you can mix those three around. I think if it if it gets any worse than that, you're wandering into areas that we've probably not seen before. You know, I think... You see Casemiro, our, own, our only holding midfielder, having to play at centre-back and somebody has to play holding midfielder like Bruno. I think you see things like maybe Delo shifting into centre-back because actually he's not dissimilar to Luke Shaw in build and the way he plays the game. Um, maybe even Scott McTominay as well at centre-back. So I don't think we're going to see Manchester United do anything revelationary in relation to centre-back. I think it's going to be get by with what we've got. Um, and as I said on the show last night, what a show it was previewing the Forest game. I think every game now, I don't think I'm previewing it saying United are going to win comfortably. I think every game now we've got to expect a battle. I think every... this, Not not disrespecting what United can achieve, I still think we can get top four win the Europa League and the FA Cup. It's just going to be a lot harder. We're now in the Premier League weaker than we were a couple of days ago. This Premier League's very competitive. I think you go to Forest, you play Villa at home, you play Spurs away. You could lose all three of those. You could win all three of those. We've got to fight... That's what we've got to do. We've got to do what everyone else has been doing in this Premier League all season. And we don't have the luxury of having big game players like Marcus Rashford, Martinez and Varane, especially Martinez and Varane and that, that central spine. We don't have that luxury of, of what I would define as top class players in those centre-back positions now. We are vulnerable. That makes us vulnerable as a team. We've got to work harder. It's as simple as that. Um, my first choice centre-back pairing, by the way, would be Lin uh, Luke Shaw and Lindelof. Um, I just think it gives us balance. Um, in some ways, we're a little bit small, but Luke Shaw's six foot, and I think Lindelof's just about six foot as well, so we're not that small. Um, there's more mobility. Uh, I think Luke Shaw and Lindelof is the way I would go. I don't think he'll do that. I think Harry Maguire's obviously going to start. 
You'd have to play Malassia and wan as the fullbacks, or you could play De Lowe at left-back, but that's what I would do. Um, but I'm not the manager. I think we will see Victor Lindelof and Harry Maguire with Luke Shaw at left-back, and I think Maguire will go back to being the left-sided left-back. Now he knows that Martinez is out for a while. I think he's more comfortable in the left side. Um, I think he only moved to the right because he thought that he could take Varane's spot. So I think we'll see Maguire go back left-sided centre-back. Um, interesting about Polini though, especially about the strikers and Ten Hag's comments. Get your comments in below. Where do you think we're heading about the striker? Would you welcome someone like Polina? And what are you thinking about the centre-back combination for the next three weeks without Varane? Get your comments in below. Smash a like on the video. I'll speak to you a little bit later on.